So I have often said it's good to get a different view from a different, you know, country's, you know, sort of newspaper to see what they're saying about you. <laughs> and in particular today, this is one such good example. As you may very well know, we've talked a lot, and I mean a lot, about the EU retained law bill because it has the potential to cause absolute chaos. Why? Well, for one, all this EU law, after sort of Brexit, was brought into the UK statute book, so it sort of became UK law, but also it would help the transition, and the whole idea was that it would, you know, be revisited later, and if changed necessarily, you know, at a later time, the whole parliamentary scrutiny debate that Brexiteers apparently at that time really loved and cared about. Then, of course, along came Jacob Rees-Mogg with his own crazy idea that, right, we are going to get rid of all the EU laws in a year's time. <laughs> yes, a year's time. Meaning that potentially the UK government is going to have to go and scour thousands, at least uh, we know at least 4,000, potentially a lot more, of UK legislation to see, is it European or not? And this has the potential to blow big holes in our laws, our statutes, our regulations. Oh, it's it has the potential to do so much damage. Um, as a lot of people have said, this is absolutely lunacy. Why have we why have we done this? Why are you putting this forward? Now it is in the House of Lords at the moment. Because obviously, well, the Conservative was sort of whipped very much along ideological ground, you know, you will vote for this. Um, like I say, there was uh, sort of rumors there were gonna be a three-line whip, but I think it turned out to be a two-line whip uh, at the at the uh, at the end. And of course, unfortunately. This is now in the House of Lords, and of course we've got to hope that the House of Lords basically decides to play parliamentary ping-pong and just wax it back straight to the Commons. That's certainly what we can hope today. Like I say, there is a lot of opposition to this in the Lords, uh, so we can hope that it does not pass there. Otherwise, this is going to cause a lot of problems, big time. And, of course, it's not just the problem with UK law. The EU has also said, well, if you're going to do this, then we're going to sort of replicate retaliatory tariffs because you agreed in the withdrawal agreement to a level playing field provision. If you don't do that, up go some more tariff barriers. It makes trading with the EU even more costly than businesses are already finding it. And businesses are already struggling to trade with the EU as it is. So doing this makes it even more difficult and yet as you can see from the headline sunak is heading straight towards another cliff edge it could be yeah <coughs> needs to say this could get quite tasty very quickly so before we go having a look what the washington post has to puzzle about all this uh as it looks across the channel um not the channel the atlantic shall we say in this case but uh, as always, please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there are links to my Patreon page and a one official link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can Buy Me Coffee. And of course, the YouTube thank you button. And of course, the uh, Pony Club as well, uh, too. So, and of course, uh, like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, ring the bell as well. So, you know, all, you know all the drill by now. So, let's go over to the Washington Post. Let's see what they've got to say about this. So, Rishi Sunak has occasionally been criticised for an approach to government that is more managerial consultant than political visionary. Because, well, he didn't really have a vision, uh, that's for sure. But even his detractors acknowledge he has brought a level of professionalism to 10 Downing Street, missing from his predecessors, being Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. And yet, it only takes one major misstep for a reputation of competence to unravel. And I will say this, Surak is not as competent as he as he claims to be. He is absolutely politically weak. We have seen them, you know, do and abandon bills already left, right, and center, or have to make concessions. We've seen rebellions about rebellions. 
Sunak is just so politically weak and he is trying to tiptoe around as much as he possibly can. But it ain't working. It ain't working at all. Uh, like I say, I fully expect there to be a uh, general election uh, this year. So let's continue. So with the government's bill to scrap thousands of European laws debated in the House of Lords earlier this week and sent for committee review on the February the 23rd, Sunak looks to, sac to set to sacrifice that hard-earned reputation on the altar of hardline Brexit ideology. Championed by the former business secretary, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the retained EU law bill or the revocation and reform bill, to give its full name, introduces a cliff edge, how retro uh, you might think, and the end of this year. And it's not just directed EU legislation that would disappear, but areas of subordinate legislation. These are British laws passed over some four decades ago to implement various obligations as an EU member and will also go poof. Ministers can also extend this cliff edge, but only up to June the 23rd of 2026. Yes, the 10-year anniversary of the Brexit referendum. And if passed, it is hard to overstate the potential disruption for businesses, workers, and entire sections of the economy. Oh, there we go. So, there is nothing wrong with the principle of amending or revoking EU laws. And again, I agree, there is nothing wrong with that in principle. Of course, you're allowed to, you know, sort of amend and, and, and do these things. So indeed, cutting red tape. Those laws were in incorporated into the UK rulebook to prevent legal chaos after the UK left the EU with the idea that over time, the UK would revisit them as needed following proper parliamentary debate and scrutiny. And of course, that's what we all expected to happen in a quote normal parliamentary uh secession but uh, as, as you know um anything has been but normal since 2016 in parliament because we've got absolute free market fundamentalist fanatics like jacob Rees-Mogg running around saying that no the market should be free you don't understand <laughs> you know it's going to be the government should have no say in, in, in the market whatsoever and that is their driving reason behind this bill they knew that they could not succeed in getting rid of all the regulation but if they were to make a big enough dent then that could be happy. They could sort of live with that because then, well, you know, they can sort of, you know, untie the rest of this regulation later. So, the principle of ending the supremacy of EU law is unproblematic. That's a big reason the UK left the EU. But practicalities matter. As we've seen with so many aspects of Brexit, the bill starts with the premise that any such laws are unnecessary unless proven otherwise. That leaves only months for the scrutiny of thousands of complex pieces of legislation, putting the process at the mercy of, in of industry lobbies or even the hasty conclusions of frenzied civil servants. And for those who thought Brexit was a part about restoring power to lawmakers in Westminster, the bill instead gives government ministers sweeping powers, including to, quote, restate or change legislation even dramatically without parliamentary oversight. And that was the other part of this, because this bill gives government ministers the ability to be able to just go, oh, uh, parliament passed this legislation? Don't think so. <laughs> and that is why we should be worried about this, because it gets rid of that parliamentary sovereignty, that pure parliamentary supremacy that Brexiteers loved, but then all of a sudden don't really like when Parliament doesn't do things uh, that it wants. Uh, again, to many of these Brexiteers, you know, they like Parliament when it's doing the things they like, but hate Parliament when it's not doing the things that it wants. <coughs> so, a dashboard set up by the government suggests that there are more than 3,700 laws that will be affected. It's actually 4,200 laws, a bit of a correction for you in Washington Post, uh, that will be affected. But even after the late additions, it's clearly incomplete. In fact, there is no reliable list of all retained law that could just fall away or change, nor has the government made clear 
which pieces of legislation it wants to restate or rescue. You can just see how how crazy this bill is. And I keep on telling you just how maddening this bill is. And even someone you know, that's, that's across the Atlantic is just looking at this, just going, what on earth are you doing? What on earth are you about to do? So, <coughs> don't be silly, it supporters counter when concerns are raised. This is just about clearing the underbrush so Brexit can deliver benefits. Your rights and protections are safe with us. Businesses and workers will be forgiven for wanting that in writing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they want it heavily in writing. And I'm so glad, by the way, that we have seen uh, European, uh, or at least unions based in the EU, saying that no further trade deals should be done or at least any deals should be done with the UK unless it actually guarantees workers' rights. And that, to be honest, is a really good move, and certainly a good move for solidarity for workers, not only just uh, here in the UK, but potentially around the world as well. So, while financial services and tax are not in the scope of this bill, I wonder why, <laughs> pretty much everything else seems to be. This includes workers' rights, food hygiene, intellectual property, the safety of electronic equipment, toys, cosmetics, environmental reg regulations, pensions, and much more. As I said, the scope of this bill is insane. And yet they're still going ahead with this. Business leaders, industry groups, unions, and many in Sunak's own party have all warned this bill creates regulatory uncertainty for business, insecurity for workers, and places an unreasonable burden on an already overstretched civil service. And EU leaders have also reportedly warned Sunak that the approach could put Britain in breach of the level playing field provisions of the UK-EU trade deal, which are designed to ensure that Britain doesn't give itself an unfair trading advantage by lowering standards in certain areas. So, <coughs> this is going to be insane if this bill passes. Um, yeah, I... You know, we're warning about it now, but the chaos that could be created by this is is just unknown. It, it, it really is. It's just insane, some of this, what this actually bill allows to do. So the bill also permits domestic courts to depart from EU case law in many cases and establish the principles of EU law, such as proportionality or even respect for fundamental rights, and used to interpret EU legislation, will no longer be automatically accepted. That does not mean the UK no longer respects those rights, but it risks legal uncertainty. So yet another problem this bill is going to create. There is always uh, the defanning, uh, there is always uh, the ways to defang the bill. And of course, the House of Lords will no doubt put forward some ideas. One will be simply just to scrap the sunset clause, which is unlikely since its backers regard this as a key provision. The government could also uh, go to switch metaphors to puff the, push the cliff edge further out. But the longer this drags on, the greater the uncertainty for businesses and the more time for business lobbies to plead various cases before ministers. Ministers may also seek the blanket of excursions for legislation in their portfolio, which might give some industries temporary relief, but not solve the broader uncertainty. This may not be a trigger for a bond market crash, as was Trust's ill-designed ill budget, Ill budget. But as with tax cutting, deregulation must be done properly. Like Brexit itself, such legislative license sows uncertainty, with the increase in costs and lower confidence. As supremely political as a supremely political bill, any meaningful change requires political will, and it is hard to think of a bigger political test for Sunak, the one that forces him to choose between the principles of sound governance and the politics of Brexit still eating away at his party. And yeah, I agree. Sunak is so weak, he cannot... He cannot make any decision about this. This is this is what is infuriating. <coughs> Even other Brexiteers were coming out and saying, um, 
yeah, this this bill is is unnecessary. This 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 bill is 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 weird. What what why why are we pushing this bill? You know, why am I even a Brexiteer being told to to push for this bill that is is quite frankly crazy? We we saw that happen when we we talked about it initially, but it's still what a lot of these crazy free market fundamentalists want, and it's it's going to end so badly if this passes. <coughs> But, yeah, like I say, we're keeping an eye on it. We are keeping a very close eye on what happens here. But needs to say, if this passes, this is full, you know, traditional Brexit cliff edge. Whoosh. Something that we manage to avoid very often at the last moment. You know, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, Liz Truss, all heading straight towards the cliff edge. And they're literally swerving at the last second, you know, managing to swerve away. But this is generally a, a, a shocking moment. This could cause absolute untold disaster in so many X sectors at a time when they do not need this. But, yeah. Um, you can see just how bad and the disasters that are going to come from this. And we've said it over and over and over again. This bill is meant to cause this. Because those hard Brexiteers, this is what they're all about. We've got to just get rid of as many regulations as we possibly can. Except in the financial services market and, you know, taxes. But ignore those. <laughs> Everything else, fair game. And so... You get now their crazy deregulationist agenda being put forward before us. As was said, you know, workers, unions, all these businesses want these guarantees in writing. Oh, if these uh, laws are, are going to be safe, then why are you moving to get rid of them? I mean, it has been left to Labour to try and uh, sort of guarantee uh, these workers' rights in, in the bill. They've said you cannot touch any workers' rights, even if it's in the EU legislation, you cannot touch them at all. Whether they will, of course, um, uh, you know, continue to do that, given the fact that now Kimmy Badnock, Minister for Business, now uh, again back in charge of the the business department, um, could very well just go. Well, oh, this this EU uh, working time directive, where it says you know you're only allowed to work so many hours a week. Uh, well, uh, we think that's a bad on British productivity. Goodbye. And remember, Kersey Katang made uh, efforts at the start of his tenure as business secretary to try and remove that. Now, he didn't because there was a big pushback from it. But there's no reason why someone like Kerry Badmark might just go, whoop, gone. Which is, again, why this bill is so dangerous, because they now have the power to do that without any parliamentary scrutiny. This is why this bill continues to be so dangerous, and it continues to be potentially one of the next big, and I mean really big, Brexit battles. Because it's going to cause so many problems. So, so many. So, as always, uh, thank you very much for watching, and of course, please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button, and of course, we'll see you all next time.